So thermochem has um, certain key vocabulary terms. That's why I needed you guys to uh, front load that by watching those videos. But there's one um, portion that I need to, it's a conversion math calculation that's pretty straightforward. Uh, one of the assignments that I asked you yesterday um, is to keep track of your calorie uh, cons consumption within a day. So kind of looking into what are the amount of calories in maybe you had cookies or something. Um, it's an estimation, but the idea is that you we're using that value in order for us to practice, but at the same time to give you a sense of like, well, what are these units of calories and how does it relate to the units that we're gonna be using in this topic of thermochem, which is joules, the conversion between those two units. The conversion factor, Make sure we have everyone muted real quick. Um, if your mic is on, can you make sure it's muted so the background noise doesn't interfere? Um, so some things to note about calorie, it is a measure of energy, but it is the more common one that people are familiar with because it's what's being used in products, um, in any of the cons consumer products. And it's often, you always hear when people are talking about diet. The one thing about in, in chemistry is that we have the main unit is in fact is called joules. So we need to be able to convert calories to joules. Unfortunately, they made it even more confusing by having the uppercase calorie and the lowercase calorie. So the uppercase calorie is what we're uh, familiar with. So if you look at um, maybe you had some dinner that was estimated to be 500 calories or, or more, then that's uppercase calorie. So our conversion factors here, this, they're letting us know that an uppercase calorie is actually a thousand of the lowercase calories, which if you have a one is to a thousand ratio, um, then isn't that another way of saying a kilo of something? So our conversion factor is, and I, I've made it so it's a different color or at least like for it to stand out. So we're dealing with a capitalized calorie, what we're familiar with um, is converted into a thousand of the lowercase, which is also one kilocal. Now, how to convert that to joules is if you have it in lowercase calorie, it turns out that 4.184 joules, uh, or it's equivalent to 4.184 uh, joules. So in the example in the bottom, they're converting 30,000 calories uh, to joules. So it's just a matter of doing dimensional analysis. What we're familiar with, uh, 30,000 times 4.184 gives us a pretty big value. And you'll notice a lot of the times for, for today, as I'm explaining the, the topic of thermochem calculations, there's quite a lot of these big uh, values. Now, on the other hand, if you're asked to convert that from like lowercase to uppercase, then it's just a matter of using our conversion factor, dividing by a thousand that gives us the 30 capitalized uh, calories. Um, I'll show you an example. So what we have here, I'm sure I can see the screen, is the, the daily adult consumption, at least what they recommend, and it all varies depending on your diet and your activity level, is 2,000. So 2,000 capitalized calories, and when converted to lowercase, isn't it 2 million? So it's a much bigger value. And then finally, if you're asked to convert it to joules, then using the conversion factors that I just showed you, it ended up converting to about 8,368 joules. So it's a giant value. What does that mean to have that many joules? What you could do using your own um, numbers in converting that uh, to joules. You can use this chart or table to get an estimation of what activities tip, uh, would you have to do and how long uh, in order for you to burn a certain amount of, of energy in, in joules. For example, a simple, uh, just studying, sitting right in front of your computer, reading or watching something, it already involves a certain amount of energy um, because our body is constantly working, right? The cells in our body is constantly needing that energy. Um, there are certain activities that requires more, 
for example, swimming and running. Um, so if, if going back to our example over here, this is about 8 million uh, joules of energy. So it seems like to utilize as much of, of that 8 million joules of energy requires a little over two hours of going for one. Like keep in mind again, it doesn't mean just because you run two hours, you used up all of that. Like your, your body kind of like apportions the, the energy depending on where it's needed. Like the cells need that energy uh, as well. So my suggestion is to use your own uh, total calories, convert that to, stop like this, your total calories, convert it to lowercase, and then convert it to joules. And then take a look at which activities you can do in order for you to burn you know, or I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm just saying like, if you have that much calories, these would have been the activities that would help burn those calories. All right. So the next one, what I'll do, th these are more practice problems for calorie conversion on Monday during office hours. But when I encourage you to try this, but if you need more help with calorie conversion between calories and joules, then on Monday during office hours, stop by, we can look over these practice problems. I want to spend more time on, on the other topics because this is really more of, here's the conversion, can you use it? Can you go back and forth between those two different units? All right. There are certain key vocabulary terms um, that I want to address, and these were from the video. Uh, that's why I wanted to make sure, so for those of you who have not done so, please make sure. I waited, I'm waiting till today, because some of the periods, um, I think your class had kind of a head start on it compared to third and fifth period. So I needed to kind of give them some time to catch up. But I'm gonna download all the Google Form responses. So if you have not done so, please make sure to do that. Um, but these are some of the key vocab that showed up on that Google Form that uh, the videos that I had asked you to watch. Thermochem is all about the changes in, in energy within a system. Uh, when they say system, they're referring to like a chemical reaction. So let's say if we have a uh, chemical reaction in the beaker, the system would be what's happening inside. And then the universe is everything outside of that. So anything that's surrounding that reaction is considered, uh, they call it the surrounding or the universe. Those are the two terms. So every, every time you see system, they're referring to, at least in this topic, they're referring to the chemical reactions. Um, we are, there are two main topics, or two main classifications of energy, potential and kinetic. Definitions are here, but in, in the context of chemistry, whenever you hear potential energy uh, in chemistry, they're stored in bonds. So in chemical bonds, that's where we can find these potential energy. Uh, kinetic energy is energy in motion. And I know there's a formula here. It's really more of a math uh, formula that, that's kind of illustrated at the bottom here. But what's, what's important here is the idea that every molecule and atoms are constantly vibrating. They're constantly in motion. It doesn't matter if that particular compound or solution is uh, in a cold temperature. They still have some sort of vibration, some sort of motion to them. The only time where there is absolutely no motion at all would be at absolute zero, meaning zero Kelvin. So that's kind of the only time that we can observe, we cannot observe any of these, uh, the presence of, of kinetic energy. All right, so another key vocab uh, mentioned in the videos I asked you to watch is the idea of exo versus endothermic energy or changes. The chart on the left graph here, it's illustrating exothermic. The idea for exothermic is that we're starting high, like it has a lot of stored potential energy. And then it's um, every, ener every reaction will always have to surpass what's known as the activation energy, kind of this kind of, uh, like a, well, it looks like a bump, but you could think of it as a, um, like a threshold that needs to be overcome before you can get to the product. Um, in exothermic, it's starting high, the energy, and then you end up lower at the end. So whatever the change in energy, whatever was released, um, is the delta E of exothermic reactions. The delta E here 
since our product is lower, so it's a smaller value, and their starting point is higher, if you subtract those two, final minus initial, you're going to end up with a negative delta E. So exothermic reaction, I know it's not filled in here, but if you, know, it can, if you type this up or like if you fill that in, it would say the delta E is negative. Um, so negative energy, negative delta E corresponds to exothermic. The opposite of that would be endothermic. Uh, so endothermic is starting low, so it doesn't have a lot of potential energy, but at the end, they end up with uh, a lot more. So based on whatever reaction that occurred, you're able to gather more of that energy and store that energy. So um, you'll notice though that activation energy is a lot higher. So there's a big jump there. Um, which tends to slow down this process. Endothermic tends to be slower than exothermic. And we can use the analogy of, of let's say, climbing in the mountain or like uh, hiking. So if you're starting high, kind of midway point already, and then you end up kind of on the valley on the other side, although you have to climb to the top, it doesn't require you that much effort. So now on the other hand, for endothermic, you're starting in the valley and you're going to the other side, that's a, a big uphill that you have to climb, right? So it requires a greater amount of energy to surpass that activation of energy portion. So to fill this in, endothermic, the energy is flowing into the system, meaning they're absorbing that energy. Um, and because they're absorbing the energy, the value will be a positive delta E. So exothermic will be negative delta E, and then endothermic will be a positive delta E. I think the next slide kind of reinforces that. Yeah, so same kind of idea. The video was addressing this whole concept of like work and heat. Um, but the takeaway really is the concept that in a, if a reaction is giving off heat, it's exothermic. If it's absorbing heat, then it's endothermic. The majority of what I want to focus on today is the, the math calculation, because the concept's easy to, to like understand by watching those videos. Uh, so I want to spend some time explaining um, the math for this unit of thermochem. We've seen this chart before. It's called a heating curve. And the idea for this heating curve is that we are starting with a lower energy. And as time progresses, heat is getting added, or energy is being added to a system. And let's say the system starting as a solid compound, it gets to the point, like, so when you get to this point right here, this is the melting point. And it's starting to melt. And now you've turned everything into a liquid, and then energy is being added still, so we're heating up that liquid. And when you get to this point, this would be the boiling or the vaporization point. And then now it's going through that physical change. And then finally, we turn it into gas, and you can keep heating it up. Technically, it extends further, but for what we need right now, um, we can stop there, like uh, at the gas form, and we're adding energy to it. If you, if you think about it, there's two patterns we're seeing here. We have the inclines, meaning the ones with, with slopes, the positive slope. And then we have the flat uh, horizontal portion of the graph. The horizontal portion are phase changes. You know, we're either melting, or if you're going the opposite direction, we're freezing. We're vaporizing on this part, or opposite direction is condensing. So are those phase changes? The energy is still being added to the system, but what's happening is they're using that energy to go through these phase change. On the other hand, all of the incline portions, or all of the parts where there's a positive slope, uh, those are change in temperature. So we might have a piece of solid, but if we keep adding energy to it, it will pick up that energy and it will change its temperature. Same thing with liquid. You could have water at um, 20 degrees Celsius, but we can keep heating it up and it will get to 80 degrees Celsius. So the idea is that as long as we're not vaporizing it yet, all we're doing is we're changing that energy up to a point where there is a phase change occurring. So the, the goal for today is I'm going to teach you the calculation for the incline portions, the ones where there's a change in temperature. So here, there, this entire set there, and this portion. They'll have one formula that we're, we're going to be using. And then the second 
portion will be I'll teach you how do you calculate right here the energy needed to vaporize or condense and then finally over here the energy needed to melt or freeze so it'll be a kind of a three step um, or three different calculations and I'll, I'll try to do this in, in, in steps let's start first with the inclines so the part where there is a change in temperature the formula is called Q is equal to SM delta T. Um, Q in this case is heat or energy and kind of an odd choice for uh, like a unit or like a representation, a letter to represent it. But further on, there's a, a bit more of an explanation for it. But so we're calculating the heat, energy needed. Now S is specific heat capacity every compound and molecule or atom has its own specific heat capacity. If you look at the table in the bottom, um, water has a high specific heat capacity. And the way to understand specific heat would be, it requires a certain amount of energy um, to, or the higher the number for that S, it, it means it, you need more energy to change the temperature of one gram of that substance by one degree. That's essentially like, in fact, the definition that's written up there. So it re, like for water, it requires four joules of energy. To, so I can change the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. You'll notice for iron and gold, the metals tend to have low specific heat. And it, in, a, you know, in a way it makes sense because the idea here is that if you have a smaller specific heat value, then that means you could, the, it's able to absorb heat faster because you don't need that much energy to change its temperature. Um, so if I'm boiling water in like over a stove, then doesn't the, 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 let's say the pot that I'm using for it, it's made of metal, it heats up faster before you know, the water in, inside starts to heat up. Like it takes a bit more time for the water to start boiling because water has a higher specific heat compared to the, the pot that you're using that's made of, of metal. Um, in the next slide, there's a bit more detail to it. But uh, M here signifies mass, so not moles. And then the triangle T is delta T, which signifies change in temperature. So whenever there's a, a delta, it's always the final minus initial, meaning what is the final temperature minus what we started with. Uh, to remind you again where we use that formula, we use it here, we use it there, and finally right here, whenever there is a change or there's an incline um, in, in the graph. Uh, in the word problem, it might say, what if you have a liquid that's starting, starting at 10 degrees, and you're heating it up to 80 degrees, then, the, then that would be the formula that we're gonna be using for it. So we're going from some temperature, initial temperature to a final temperature. Um, let's try one practice problem. Go to, there we go, Not too far. So uh, still the same formula. And the idea here is that they are, uh, telling us that, or they're telling us this is a heating step, meaning we're, we're not going through a phase change, we're just changing the temperature. Um, all the examples, or both examples here, is for water. And water's um, specific heat capacity is 4.18. And we saw this in the, the table in the previous slide. The formula again is Q is equal to SM delta T, so right here. S is a constant for that compound. Every compound will be different. So for water, it's this number, 4.18. M is mass in grams. And then delta T is the change in temperature. At the end, depending on what the question is asking you to do, you might have to do a conversion. Because in this problem, most what are the unit that you'll get, like if you plug in everything correctly, you'll end up with a unit of joules. But what if the problem is asking you to uh, report your answer in kilojoules? then you're going to have to do this extra step, dividing the answer by a thousand, uh, by a value of 1,000. Let's try this practice problem, example one. So they're giving us 360 grams of liquid water. I'm going to try to squeeze it in on this side. So we're calculating for Q, which is the heat. 
and our S, since this is water, is 4.1H. And then in this problem, they are, they're already giving us grams. So I don't need to do a conversion. Some problems might give us kilograms, which means you're going to have to turn it to grams first, um, which is a multiplied by a thousand. But in this case, it's already in grams. So pretty straightforward. And 60 grams. And then our delta P. Now the word problem here says the water is at room temperature, so they're starting at 25, but they need it to get to the boiling point. They're not telling us that they're vaporizing it, they're just saying they're heating it up up through its boiling point. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees, one of the things from the video that was mentioned. So if it's 100 degrees is their final temperature and 25 is their starting point, then wouldn't it be 100 minus 25, which is 75, that's obvious there. So now let me plug in everything so we can have a value here. 4.18 times 360 times 75. So that gives us a Q value of 112.860. Now the unit for this, if you look at all of the other units that's getting canceled out, the grams will get canceled out, the Celsius will get canceled out. So what's left behind would be joules. J-E-L-E-S, or you can just put capitalized J. So this is our final answer for example one. Example two, I'd like you to give it a try. Um, but and on Monday, again, if you want more practice, there's a few other things I could go to. Uh, but it's important that you try as many examples to try to make sense of this. All right, so this is our first calculation to remind you again when do we use that use it right here right here and right here I was like the third or fourth time to remind you but it's, it's important that you you hear that now the next one is what do we uh, how do we figure out the energy needed to vaporize so meaning this point what if the word problem says I have this um, liquid let's just say water and it's already at its boiling point. How much energy is needed for me to turn all of them into gas, to vaporize the whole thing? So if that's the, what the question is asking, then what we're gonna be using is this calculation. And um, it, it, all, it involves two steps. So the first step is asking us to convert, because most of the data, like if we're doing a lab, the data would be grams because it's something we can measure. But the, the idea here is that we got to convert that grams to moles. So we know that that conversion is something we've done many times before. You divide it by the molar mass. And then the second step says, once you know the moles, all you need to do is multiply that by the constant molar heat of fusion. Every uh, compound will have its own constant for um, molar heat of fusion. Molar heat of fusion is another way of saying this is the amount of energy. Uh, oh, actually, sorry. Kind of my mistake here. This one, is where we're on this topic, it's actually referring to this step. Molar heat of fusion is referring to this step, meaning it's the melting or freezing. So back to this. Um, I need to draw. Now, we have uh, we have two steps. So again, the first one is just asking us to turn it into moles. I'm going to use example one. Uh, we have 200 grams. But then to turn that into, um, into moles, don't I need the molar mass of water? Because this is it's referring to ice. Um, so now, if I add it up on the periodic table, roughly, uh, it's going to not an exact value, but isn't it 18 grams per mole? So if I add up oxygen plus hydrogen plus hydrogen, adds up to about 18.02, I think, but we'll go with 18. So let me divide that, 200 divided by 18. So that gives me 11.11 .11 moles. So now the second step, they said, once you have your moles, all we need to do is multiply that by the constant molar heat of fusion. So for water, its constant is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. And 
uh, since I have it in my calculator, let me just plug that in. That gives us 66.8, and it's like a repeating value. The moles get canceled out, so what's left behind is the unit of kilojoules. Now, we uh, what we've done here is the calculation for what is the amount of energy needed to melt or freeze. The only difference is that if it's positive, then this is the energy needed that um, for for melting. But if it's freezing, if the problem says how much energy is needed to freeze, it will be the same calculation, but now the, the value will be different. We're actually going to put a negative. So now we're, we're not adding energy because we're not, you know, melting requires an addition of energy. Freezing means like energy needs to be like released, right? So that would be a negative value. So it's the only difference between melting and freezing. The calculation is the same. All right, let me clear this. So the last one uh, that I'd like to explain today, and then we'll get to your questions, would be this step for this step right here. So now uh, this is a vaporization step or condensation. So we're adding, we're either adding energy to vaporize or we're removing energy to condense. The calculation is very similar to what we just saw. And that involves converting the um, mass to moles again, so same as before, and then multiplying it by the constant for, for vaporization. Again, all the examples today are with water, so that number could change depending on what the compound is. But if the word problem is asking you to solve for the energy, all, you know, that constant will have to be provided because we can't have two unknowns. So in this example, they're giving us 1,000 grams of water. So I'm going to convert our water because it's asking us first to convert it to 1,000 grams. Water, again, is 18 grams per mole. Mole. So that gives us 1,000 divided by 18, about 55.55, and it's repeating moles. So now, all we need to do now is multiply this by the constant. Um, a little bit messy here, but I'll write over it. 40.6. The idea again is that they, we now have it in moles. We can now multiply it to the constant and then cancel out the unit of moles. So that gives us total value. And you'll notice they tend to, or it gives us a bigger value because it doesn't make sense. It requires more energy for us to vaporize, to, to turn something into gas as opposed to melting it. Like melting requires energy, but to vaporize it requires as much as about seven times more uh, for us to really break apart these molecules, these intermolecular forces to turn liquid water into water vapor. All right, let me clear that. So again, or the, the last slide I'm gonna show today, all I've done is consolidate the three types of calculations. So this slide is the same as what you've seen in the previous one, but just kind of putting it all on one slide. Whenever the question is asking you to calculate the energy to melt or freeze, then it would be um, a series of steps, convert to moles, multiply by the constant. If it's asking us anything at all with change in temperature, they said we're going from this temperature to that temperature, then we're going to use this formula of Q is equal to SM delta T. And then finally, the problem is asking, what is the energy needed to vaporize or to condense? Then it's going to be the problem like this. I'm going to pause the recording so you guys could ask your questions if you have or stop the recording.